Well, I've actually proposed quite a few of these searches myself. And uh, the way I think about it is that basically, if you ask what can the dark matter do to us, uh, there are certain kinds of dark matter that people have been looking at for quite a while, where basically the dark matter comes and hits something and it deposits some energy, and that's something that you actually go and see. Uh, that is one kind of dark matter. The kind of dark matter that I've been looking for uh, are sort of much uh, lower mass particles, they're much lighter, and uh, they tend to have basically, one can say, four possible effects. One is, uh, as the dark matter is going through, and if you have a nuclear spin, it can make the nuclear spin rotate, and you can uh, sort of, as the spin rotates, there's a magnetic field of the spin that changes. That's something you can measure. Uh, the dark matter could potentially also drive currents in small circuits. And as you drive up a current, you'll be able to see the magnetic field of that current. That's something you can measure. Then there's another possibility where the dark matter directly exerts a force on an object. And if you have a very precise uh, accelerometer, uh, then you can measure that force. So those are like three major ways in which this can happen. And there's a fourth possibility where the dark matter basically can control the mass of fundamental objects, like the mass of the electron, things of that sort. So if the dark matter goes through you, the mass of the electron could be changing, for example. And that is something you would be able to measure using something called an atomic clock, a very precise tool like that. Well, so uh, this is a kind of a slightly controversial topic among some people. Uh, so I have actually worked in the past on how one can use atomic clocks, for example, as a way to detect gravitational waves. The idea there is basically that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, essentially you take, let's say, two clocks and you separate them by some distance. And you can think of the experiment as me sending you sort of light pulses every second. If there's no gravity wave between us, the distance rem between us remains constant. So if, so if I send you light every second, you also receive them every second. Well, when there's a gravitational wave, it changes the distance between us. So even though I'm sending you light every second, you receive them at a second plus epsilon, second minus epsilon. So that's a small modulation you can measure with a uh, atomic clock, for example. So I've worked on ideas of that sort in the past. Uh, so, and, and in addition to LIGO, uh, it's also true that there's something called pulsar timing arrays. So these are actually ex uh, experiments that already exist, uh, and they're very interesting, where basically one looks at the fact that are these pulsars, which are, you know, sort of these uh, neutron stars spinning out in the middle of nowhere, and they're known to be incredibly stable clocks, uh, that they spin, you know, very, very accurately. And you can sit on the Earth and try to measure the signals that, that you're getting from these pulsars. So once again, if there's a gravitational wave that goes between us and the pulsar, then the arrival times would modulate. And so that's, the, and I think, another very interesting way to find uh, gravitational waves. 